100 years. If it wasn't for you, my life would be different. Maybe I'd have wings in a halo that glistens, or be on my bed of rest, sitting there wishing for a miracle treatment to save me from missing my life in all of its magnificent beauty. If it wasn't for you, my life would be different. I'd be afraid, locked in diabetic prison, seeking escape from the life sentence I was given, trapped in beta cells, victim of my immune system where trialing my innocence is my new duty. If it wasn't for you, my life would be different. I'd be in a complicated sporting position, obligated to fight against my opposition, a game that goes way deeper than competition, where the ref's biased to form my disadvantage. If it wasn't for you, my life would be different. I'd be like an unfinished lost composition, unable to share my cool flair rhyme and rhythm. These words of my poem would never have been written. An artist whose career has been mismanaged. From an era when technology began to astound, where the world's first airplane flew off the ground, where crosswords were flipping, throwing words all around, where Lewis Nixon invented Sona Sound. The story starts way back in 1981, on the 14th of November in Canada, Alliston. The birth of William and Margaret's famous son who will help change the world in fighting type one. A smart young man who began to advance in his incredible mind, an imagination enhanced, to learn to ask questions, a plan to understand, puzzles at hand connecting intricate pieces like DNA strands, stretching his knowledge like an unbreakable elastic band, absorbing information like his brain was quicksand. This man had ambition, in his life he took command to leave a long-lasting legacy on the land. In 1910, he attended Victoria College. After failing his first year, he made himself a promise to learn from failure and increase in his knowledge. By 1912, in medical school is where he flourished. He was a courageous man with no chip on his shoulder. In 1914, he tried to join the army in August and October. He was refused due to poor eyesight, yet the fight was not yet over. By 1915, he became a medical soldier. By 1916, he was fast-tracked to complete his medical course. On December the 16th, he graduated. The next day, he'd report to military duty, where he then went to war. He fought to save lives against the German Empire force. In 1918, the Battle of Cambrai was fought, where he was wounded. Yet despite his injuries, he bought hope to other wounded men. He helped them until he had to abort. During World War I, a hero had formed. In 1919, he was awarded the Military Cross, a prestigious award for his heroism in a war that cost thousands of soldiers' lives to be lost. But he wanted to save lives. He returned to Canada in a shot. He completed his surgical training in orthopaedic medicine, then became a resident surgeon at the hospital for sick children. Yet he was unable to gain a place on the hospital staff. So, he moved to London, Ontario, set up a medical practice, and alas, this is where his story begins to reach its pinnacle. He read an article that sparked the start of a miracle. It was about the pancreas. It piqued his interest in diabetes. He began his plan to beat the autoimmune disease. He researched day and night, determined to figure out the reason why Schaefer's named hormone insulin had died. Without insulin, a human cannot survive. The metabolism of sugar needed to be revived, as the body urinated sugar to try and stay alive. Previously, starvation diets were all that were prescribed. That would give a diabetic an extra two years of life. Moses Barron published an article which grabbed his attention. Once trypsin secreting cells died, insulin could be extracted from the Langerhans. He created a method of his own invention. McLeod provided facilities to begin experimentation. The assistants, Charles Best and James Collip, helped with production. They successfully extracted insulin from an adult pancreas in 1921. Now type 1 could be treated using insulin injections. The first was given in 1922 on January the 11th to a 14-year-old Canadian, Leonard Thompson. In 1923, him and McLeod were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology. What a dream! They split their prize money with their assistants. What a team. He went on to be the front cover of Time magazine. They continued to treat patients with diabetes. He was interested in painting in his personal life. He had a son named William and married twice. He had a fascination with aviation, which paid a tragic price. 
he was in a plane crash and in February 1941, he sadly died. He was only 49. In 1989, the Queen's mother lit a flame of hope, a tribute to him and all lives lost to diabetes. In 1991, a time capsule was buried to honour the 100th anniversary of his birth. In 1994, the year I was born, he was inducted into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. In 2004, he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. That same year, he was nominated as one of the top 10 greatest Canadians ever. I wish he could be alive so I could sincerely thank him. Who is he? He is the extraordinary Sir Frederick Grant Banting. Because of you, now my life is not different. I can do anything with my cool rhymes and rhythm. Happy World Diabetes Day and happy birthday. You've given us diabetics billions of years worth living. As we celebrate 100 years since the discovery of insulin, this poem is my tribute to you, wherever you are. I hope you like what I've written.